you so much, Nathan, for coming and joining me on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I've come to know you as sort of like the longevity guy on Twitter. Uh, you've got this, this wonderful site, Longevity Market Cap, that comes with a newsletter, uh, Longevity List, which is sort of like a job board. You're doing a, a show on Clubhouse, I believe. You've got like three or four different sites all targeted around longevity. And you've sort of like made it your mission to bring attention to this cause that obviously is very important to me as well. And I've tried to sort of bring some attention to through the podcast. So I think for, for those who don't know you, the best place to get started would be just to sort of walk people through your story a little bit, uh, sort of as, as early as you're willing to start to um, where you are today. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the podcast. I love what you're doing. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's great to just bring more awareness about longevity to the broader you know, public. Um, so for my story, I guess where it sort of begins is uh, back when I was doing a PhD, I was at uh, the University of Toronto doing a PhD in physics. And uh, I got two years in and I just had this sort of existential meltdown where I just came, became sort of disillusioned with life and just wrestling with, uh, you know, the inevitability of death, the you know ephemeral, transient nature of life, and just like this concept of um, I don't know. I guess you could just say, um, just just frustrated or um, bitter, maybe a bit of existential angst, that kind like, of stuff. Just like you know, one the, of those one, one of those quarter life breakdown types of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just wrestling with mainly this existential angst. And I, I got really just bummed out with, <laughs> with life. Uh, and uh, yeah, it became sort of like a, a major weight on me and uh, psychologically as well. And uh, at that time, I just, uh, I just couldn't take it. So I, uh, I ended up dropping out of my, my PhD. And uh, <laughs> I ended up uh, actually backpacking around the world mostly in like Asia, Southeast Asia, spent some time in Australia as well. Um, then I ended up actually in China, worked there part-time for about two years. Uh, I also did some internet marketing on the side. Um, I also discovered Bitcoin around 2015 and that sort of opened up my eyes to investing. And um, eventually I came back to Canada. That's where I'm based in Toronto. And uh, I realized, okay, well, I've, I've gone through this full circle and I, I haven't actually answered any of these questions, these, you know, existential questions. Um, what's the point of life, you know? Uh, and um, yeah, I, I was already aware of Aubrey de Grey and, you know, uh, some of the longevity stuff uh, from years back. But uh, I didn't actually really start digging deeper until maybe uh, 2018, maybe 2017. And uh, yeah, I just started off uh, reading a bit more about it, you know, watching a lot of YouTube videos. And uh, at some point I decided, yeah, okay, maybe this, this could be a thing, right? And um, uh, I started uh, just first uh, thinking about, okay, wh what can I do, right? And um, Laura Deming actually had this, uh, this talk that she gave on, uh, on, that I saw on YouTube. And it was, uh, she was saying how, uh, how there was a lot of money coming into the space compared to previous years, but there, there wasn't enough founders, right? And uh, that was interesting to me. So I was thinking, aha, maybe she's talking to me, you know, maybe she's calling me, maybe I should be a founder, right? But uh, the problem is uh, I, I don't know any biology, right? Like I, I hadn't taken high school biology or anything like that. Um, and so I figured, okay, so the first thing I should do is, you know, learn some biology. So, uh, you know, I took some courses online. Um, a really good one is the, uh, the MIT course on EDX, uh, 700X uh, Secret to Life. It's like an introductory biology course by, uh, taught by Eric Lander. And that one's really good. Uh, and, you know, I just started reading more papers and then I was looking into the space, right? Like what, what's being tried uh, in terms of like longevity biotech companies. And um, so I looked into it and uh, I figured, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe I should, you know, write 
about what I'm learning about because you know oftentimes the best way to learn about a new subject is to just write about it. So in about uh, July 2020, I started uh, the Longevity Market Cap newsletter, and uh, I was just you know looking into different companies and the science behind them, writing about longevity investing, whatever news was happening at the time, and uh, it started off uh, very slowly at first. But then it, I noticed it was growing and uh, actually exponentially. So uh, even to this day, it, it's, uh, the subscriber count is doubling uh, every seven weeks, like clockwork. And uh, of course, uh, Balaji Srinivasan has had a lot to do with that because you know, sometimes he you know, tweets about it, uh, you know, plugging my newsletter, which I'm super grateful for. But um, yeah, so that sort of took off. And um, one of the things that I noticed was, uh, people were very interested in this, right? And uh, it was becoming sort of like a community. Um, and uh, so I came to the realization that, okay, maybe me learning about all this science and you know, trying to uh, start my own longevity biotech company is not the correct play at the moment, right? Because I can spend all my time, you know, four or five years researching stuff and then finally maybe uh, start a longevity biotech company, but that's just one company. What if I could convince a hundred people to start uh, longevity biotech companies? And this is sort of like the leverage play, right? And uh, I figured, okay, maybe this is the way to do it because you know, not a lot of people know that the longevity industry is a thing, right? Not many people know that there are like 40 some odd clinical trials uh, in longevity, like trying different longevity therapeutics. And uh, I just took it upon myself to, to make this my mission, right? To just grow the amount of people in the longevity industry, people who want to either uh, work for a uh, longevity startup or people who want to you know, found longevity biotech companies, people who want to invest in this space, or just even people who, who want to like um, champion the cause through you know, media or, or, or other means, right? So that was really um, how I got to this point. And then, um, yeah, I have other projects as well. So as you mentioned, I have a longevity list, which is kind of like a jobs board, also like a longevity startup uh, company database. Um, and uh, I also have uh, the Longevity Biotech Show, which is a weekly uh, Q&A on the Clubhouse app where we just interview people who are building or funding uh, longevity biotechnology. Um, and uh, that's going to be turned into a podcast pending, you know, permission to upload the recordings to, uh, you know, Spotify and, and the rest. So yeah, that's kind of where I am now. Uh, yeah. That's great. I appreciate you sharing the story. And uh, it's, it's a great one. I, uh, I appreciate the transparency, especially on sort of early on having this, uh, you know, quarter life crisis, as I think it can sort of be summed up with. And, uh, you know, I, I had a, uh, you know, may, maybe not quite the same thing, but a similar sort of moment when I was in banking uh, a little over a year, year and a half ago. And uh, it was more of a, a gradual thing, but I sort of realized like, I don't want to climb the rungs here, uh, you know, forever. And I want to do something that's a little bit more fulfilling and, and feels meaningful. And, and like, I can sort of use my skills for, for sort of the betterment of the world and, and sort of improve myself along the way. And, uh, you know, that, that's why I quit banking. So I can sort of, uh, sympathize in a way with sort of dropping out of a, of a specific track and, and sort of taking a leap. Um, let's talk a little bit about your, your backpacking experience. Cause I think that's really interesting. Uh, I went out for, for about three months after I quit. Uh, it sounds like you went out for, for maybe years. Uh, would love to sort of hear about, you know, your, your travels through Southeast Asia and Australia, uh, stint in China, whatever sort of was, was interesting from that period of your life and sort of what you took away from it. Yeah, sure. I guess <laughs> maybe I just want to comment on your, your banking crisis, personal banking crisis. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think there's a lot of people, very smart uh, people who, who end up in banking when uh, they could also be doing like other things that are, are very cool, like, you know, pushing forward technology, like, you know, like biotechnology, uh, longevity biotechnology. And you know how, uh, who is it? 
um, I think it's Grayscale who has this campaign, you know, drop gold, right? Maybe the longevity of biotechnology, you know, industry should have a, a motto, drop banking, right? And get all the quants and all the people in banking out of there and, you know, doing more prog technically progressive stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyways, back to your point uh, about um, the question about uh, backpacking. Yeah, so um, I started off uh, in China then went around sort of like Southeast Asia for a while, you know, the typical sort of countries, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Indonesia, I also went to Singapore. Um, and then I, yeah, I ended up in Australia. That was for a holiday working visa, actually. So I was there for uh, a couple months in, a, uh, in Sydney. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing there was uh, I was extremely poor, right? Because when you're a backpacker, like you, you just don't have a lot of money in general. But uh, I ended up in Australia and um, I found it actually difficult to get like a, a normal job, like, or, like a normal sort of holiday working visa job, which is kind of like, you know, either working at a bar or like a, a restaurant or something like that. So I had to end up like uh, leaning on my, my skills, which at the time was just like physics and, and math. So I, I did a lot of tutoring at that time. And one, <laughs> one little story back then was uh, I was just searching for, for any sort of jobs for tutoring, right? And I was just looking through the classified ads. And there was this one student, like a second year electrical engineering student who, who needed tutoring in like uh, some sort of circuits course. And um, I had taken some cir circuits courses back in, um, in undergrad, but, uh, you know, second year electrical engineering is maybe a, a little bit above my pay grade, but I was so desperate for money. I was just like, hey, why not? I'll just try it. And like, you know, he can send me the textbook. And as long as I can stay like one step ahead of him, then, <laughs> then at least that will be okay. Right. And actually it worked out. You know, I learned uh, some of the stuff I already knew, but then there was other parts that I had to learn ahead of time. So that was kind of uh, a crazy experience. Uh, just being in Australia as well as like a, a poor person uh, was, was, uh, was interesting. And um, yeah, I was there for four months, then I ended up in China. And yeah, there I was also just like doing a lot of tutoring, mostly for like uh, super rich Chinese kids. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good though. It sounds like you sort of found your hustle and uh, just made it work, you know, teaching people, you know, tutoring people in, in subjects you didn't necessarily know, certainly sort of a, a risky game, but it sounds like it worked out and I'm sure you learned some things along the way. Um, when it comes to sort of like, you know, the, the reason for, for dropping out, you're sort of trying to figure out like the meaning of life. I think sometimes, you know, I tend to be somewhat of a, uh, you know, big, big question thinker myself. Uh, but I think sometimes these questions are sort of, um, you know, just not useful. Not, not that it's, you know, you shouldn't examine certain things and, and be thoughtful in life, but some questions like what is the meaning of life? I forget who it was, but someone sort of wrote something that stuck with me, which was basically like, don't spend time on questions that don't have answers. Right. And, uh, you know, you might be able to figure out your purpose or like your mission, but to, to sort of say that there's like one meaning of life, that's sort of the answer. It's like, you know, someone probably would have figured that out by now after thousands of years of, of everyone sort of thinking about it. So did you ever, I guess, like, did you resolve that or, or how did you sort of dig yourself out of this existential sort of crisis? And, and, you know, did it just sort of fade away naturally as you sort of traveled the world and had issues like, you know, figuring out how to, how to make money to worry about? Or was it something that you sort of addressed directly and uh, were able to move on from? Yeah, so I guess from a fundamental perspective, um, you can think about, okay, if, if you ask the question, uh, what is the purpose of life? And if you have no idea what the answer is, then maybe the default um, mode or the default answer should be uh, working on you know, longevity because at least then you're extending the runway or the extending the time that you have to figure out your purpose in life. Mm -hmm. So that's like maybe one way you can frame the, the argument for working on longevity, right? But then the other thing was, I guess for me personally, the existential crisis had a lot to do with like just coming to terms with death, I guess, um, and aging, of course, 
because uh, for me, it just seemed pointless to do anything when life is so transient, right? Like for, for the most part, you know, from like zero to 20 years of age or like in school, your life hasn't really begun until maybe after your 20s or whatever. But then, you know, the last, you know, 20 years of your life or, or 10 years of your life or, or, you know, your body is beginning to decline and maybe even your, your, your mind is beginning to decline. So there's really not that much time in between. And a lot of the time we're spent is spent sleeping as well, right? You know, a third of your life. And it just seemed like, okay, well, what's, what's the point of all of this? Like, you know, and just grappling with, I, I guess, yeah, the, the question of your own mortality, right? And longevity biotechnology doesn't really solve this this question. Like I, I'll, I'll be first to admit that, right? Like um, even if we can extend our lives, you know, to hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years, even if you wanted to go that far, um, you know, you can still die from being, you know, hit by a bus and other, you know, accidents or those sort of things. So it doesn't really solve that problem, but, um, you know, it could be a stepping stone to uh, other transhumanist technologies that would bring us to some sort of, you know, solution against, um, you know, death and, um, and those sort of things. Um, and of course, people will say, oh, okay, but what about the heat death of the universe? I, I think, you know, the reports of the heat death of the universe are greatly exaggerated. Like, we don't really know all the physics that's going on in cosmology. So uh, that's something that we can worry about in the future. But that being said, right, even if we don't, you know, hit these, you know, crazy moonshot goals of transhumanism and that kind of, you know, defeating death, I still think it's a worthy goal to work on longevity, right? Because uh, aging is, uh, is suffering, right? Like uh, not aging uh, chronologically, but biologically aging is a type of suffering, right? There's, there's just so much um, pain uh, that accompanies all these, you know, age-related diseases. And I think even if we don't hit the transhumanist goals of, you know, uh, crazy life extension and, you know, indefinite life extension, I think it's still a great consolation prize to be working on longevity biotechnology because we'll definitely be able to make a dent in a, a lot of these, you know, horrible age-related diseases like, you know, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's. Um, so I think um, just to, as like a, a fundamental, like moral mission, it's, it's a great thing to work on, but then there's this like sort of secret moonshot upside, you know, of convexity of the longevity escape velocity and transhumanism at the end. But, you know, I'm perfectly fine with just the consolation prize of, you know, extending human life's uh, health span and um, just reducing the suffering that comes with biological aging. Yeah, I mean, look, if, uh, if you can even just by one or 2% help to extend the average human health span worldwide by bringing attention to the cause and inspiring, like you said earlier, sort of 100 or, or however many uh, longevity founders, a couple of whom may succeed in, in a large way, then like, it's pretty hard, you know, you, you can ask a bunch of questions and, and be super critical, but it's pretty hard to say that that's a life not well spent, I think. So I sort of uh, understand your your reasoning there. I think two two points that I, I want to mention, just sort of rounding out the issue from from my perspective. One is that um, you know there's this there's a difference between sort of what is the purpose of life and like what is my purpose in life, right? And I think um, up until a little over a year ago, I had sort of run circles on, on the, that sort of issue and. And sort of had a few ideas, but um, but not really, uh, you know, I was addressing the question that you've sort of talked about, like, what is the purpose of life? And I hadn't actually spent too much time sort of personalizing it and, and looking at like, what's my purpose? And I actually took some time, um, you know, not, not a lot of time, it takes like about an hour or, or whatever, even less to sort of just sit down and say, okay, this doesn't have to be like the right answer or the permanent answer or anything like that. But if I just sit down and I try in like a sentence or two to sort of define my purpose, that's probably like a useful thing to do. Like it's probably as useful as, you know, watching the Knicks tonight or, or whatever it is. 
uh, at the very least. It's probably not a waste of my time. So I sort of sat down and did it. And I came out with something that I thought was, um, was pretty good. And, and it's not perfect, and it'll certainly change over time. But it sort of helped me set like a goalpost, which I think um, a lot of people just sort of aimlessly go. And uh, if you can just try to sort of define the goalpost and be aware that it's not perfect and it can change over time. I think it helps a lot for people to just sort of, um, you know, set a direction. And I've sort of shared this with people over time who have sort of said that it, it works, you know, a, a little bit for them at, at least. Um, and then the second thing is on, you know, life maybe having no value because it's um, transient or, or fleeting. I think like, just a, a metaphor I thought of while you were while you were saying that bit was basically like, you know, why do I go and enjoy like a great dinner, right? I, I go because, you know, the food, like it, it tastes good, right? Uh, and even though I know that it's going to end, of course. Um, and so I think like maybe the uh, the too simple and probably wrong answer for for like what's the purpose of life or like why, you know, why live? For me, it, it sort of boils down to like it tastes good, right? um, using like the metaphor. And, and I don't know if that's like a perfect answer, but it's just sort of my thoughts on, on your, uh, sort of monologue there. And then, you know, connecting this to longevity, I think that's like a super, it might sound sort of normal to you. And it, it sounds somewhat normal to me because I'm into it as well, but to the average person sort of, you know, coming to the answer of that question that you were asking and, and arriving at, like, I should work to promote longevity, super non-obvious place to end up but I sort of understand the logic. I'm curious, you know, those early days you start, you start learning about Aubrey, you start, you know, listening to, to Laura Deming saying we need more founders. Um, what was like the early days of getting started? Did you know right away, like I'm going to start writing? You mentioned like you started studying biology a little bit. Was there like, I'd love to hear about sort of your considerations getting started. Yeah, totally. I guess um, when I first started, uh, I had, I think I had watched a, a YouTube video of uh, Ray Kurzweil. It was like a documentary of him. And he was, you know, taking all these supplements to try and, uh, you know, live forever or at least close to forever. And uh, I thought that was an interesting idea, you know, just like uh, longevity escape velocity, right? And um, at some level, just like intellectually, it made sense right? To me, I figured, uh, you know, if it's possible, right? If anything isn't, uh, you know, forbidden by the laws of physics, then there's a good chance that it, it could happen, right? Like, uh, I have this sort of idea or hypothesis called uh, Murphy's Law of Innovation, which is basically, uh, given enough time, anything that can be invented will be invented, right? And if you believe in you know, to technological progressive is progressive sort of ideas, then this is, you know, not too crazy, right? But the idea is, um, okay, so there's nothing in, you know, physics that fundamentally prevents, you know, human beings from living to 500 years, right? That's very plain and obvious to me, right? And, um, but the question is, okay, but when, could we, you know, develop these technologies, right? You know, if if um, if human civilization continues its trajectory, and you know, advances in AI and other, you know, biotechnologies take us further, then this should happen at some point, right? But back then, when I was just starting in longevity, you know, learn, learning about longevity, I, I was thinking, okay, this is just something that's going to happen in the far future. Uh, it's not going to be me who does anything in, in this field because I, I don't know any biology, right? I'm just going to work on something else and just, you know, observe from the outside. But I think what we need to avoid is, you know, being uh, tempted by these sort of uh, technological determinism sort of uh, uh, viewpoints, right? Because uh, the future doesn't build itself, right? So. I, yeah, I started just learning more about it because I was like, hey, maybe I, I can do something about it. And actually, <laughs> actually, Bulaji Srinivasan had a lot to do with my, my path down this road, even though he didn't know it at the time. So uh, I had just been like tweeting just random links about longevity that I was finding. Um, 
And then one day out of the blue, he just like follows me on Twitter. And I'm like, whoa, why? Because I haven't actually done anything, right? I just know that longevity exists, right? And there's an industry, but I haven't actually done anything at all, right? And um, it was weird. It was just, I was thinking about it. Like, why, why would you, why would Balaji follow me? I, I don't, I, I didn't do anything, right? And uh, so I got this like crazy imposter syndrome. And, uh, but in a way it, it helped because it was kind of like this spooky motivation at a distance, right? Where I was thinking, okay, well, maybe I should do something about it instead of just, you know, being this imposter, maybe I can actually, uh, you know, do something about longevity, right? So uh, yeah, the initial thing, the initial sort of idea was to start a biotech company. So I, I you know, started learning biology and, um, yeah, I took a, that course that I was talking about, the, uh, the MIT course online. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the Laura Deming YouTube video was, was what really, you know, made me think, okay, well, there's a lot of money coming into the space. We need more founders. Okay, I can try and be a founder. Uh, and yeah, when I just got to the point of um, writing the newsletter, that's when I realized, okay, um, Let's let's see what's in the in the space, right? So I, I was looking at different companies, just uh, writing about uh, investing because back in uh, back in July last year, like the stock market was like on everybody's lips, right? Everybody was talking about uh, investing. So actually, I was thinking, okay, I'll write about this from an investing point of view because you know maybe that will be more interesting to you know the general public. And, um, you know, it's just a good way for me to learn about the different companies uh, that are out there. And um, yeah, so I, I didn't know that I was going to start like a newsletter. It just, just kind of happened organically. And uh, actually, the thing that actually was the first thing that I made in longevity was uh, a website called Biohack Stack, which I have. Um, it was, uh, it's basically like a kind of, documenting the different uh, regimens and routines that different people use to, you know, extend their health or, or extend their performance. So I, I had that website up, but even that was kind of like just too, too longevity light for me, right? I, I was more interested in uh, doing more radical stuff, but I just thought that was a cool idea. But then, uh, yeah, so the second thing that I actually did in longevity was, um, creating longevitymarketcap.com, which is kind of like a nod to CoinMarketCap, right? So um, for, for those who don't know, <laughs> CoinMarketCap is like one of these old websites in the cryptocurrency space where it just lists all the different uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, crypto assets by market cap. So it just ranks them, right? And I figured, okay, well, there's actually a handful of publicly traded longevity companies, but people don't even know they exist, right? So one way to, you know, just uh, get people more involved and learn about um, what's out there in the investing space of longevity is to create, you know, a similar list, but for longevity biotech stocks or, or stocks uh, related to longevity biotechnology. So that's what started first, but then the newsletter uh, followed very quickly. Uh, mainly because everybody was talking about Substack at the time. And um, yeah, I didn't really have any experience writing newsletters or anything like that. But the one thing I did know from, you know, my experience in internet marketing and especially SEO is that uh, an email list is super crucial, right? It's the only thing that you truly own. And in some ways, uh, an email list is kind of like the self-sovereign currency of media, right? Because uh, YouTube and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they can shut down your account at, at any time as we've seen in the past year, right? And so the only thing that you really own is uh, an email list. And so I thought, okay, this is cool. I can, I can you know, just write about uh, longevity. And um, yeah, it just started off very slowly. Like I, for the first couple months, like, you know, I was writing to an audience of, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 people, right? But uh, it just slowly took off. And uh, I, I was surprised because I didn't think it was 
I didn't think it was very good, actually. <laughs> and if you read some of the earlier stuff, okay, maybe don't read the earlier stuff. It's it's kind of rough, right? But it it just, you know, it evolved organically as well. And, and now it's got all these different sections, you know, I put jobs, listings. I also put um, uh, like an alert for different startups that are raising money in the longevity space, um, which is cool. Uh, but but uh, yeah, it's just like this this thing that just happened very organically. Uh, I'll just pause here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I love what you're doing. You're basically, from my perspective, building this sort of like infrastructure for longevity where you've got the top companies by market cap. It's funny, I, I'm obviously very familiar uh, with, with coinmarketcap.com, but didn't even put it together in my head that it's like a blatant uh, you know, version of that with longevity market cap. Um, but anyway, you know, you've got these top companies you've got um, this, this schedule or this calendar that I thought was really interesting of sort of like um, trials in progress, which is, which is pretty cool to monitor as well. You've got the job board with tons of interesting companies from, uh, from BioAge, who I just had the CEO, Kristen Fortney on the show, to like Loyal with, with Celine uh, running a, a company focused on, you know, health span for dogs. Um, it's just, and then, you know, sends foundation, Aubrey's organization and countless other, um, awesome companies and organizations. So you're sort of like building. And then of course the newsletter as like the media component clubhouse also maybe turning it into a podcast, all these different sort of angles that are just hopefully collecting people and giving them ways to engage, um, with the subject and, and learn more about the subject, keep up to date with the subject and, and all of that. So I think it's, it's really great. And, and I personally, I'm really enjoying it. Um, I, I didn't, I wasn't on board for the early newsletter. So maybe for the best that, that I missed those, but I've read <laughs> uh, some of the more recent ones and it's really high value stuff. So I encourage people to go and, uh, subscribe to that and, and give Nathan, uh, you know, your email in case he gets banned from Twitter for these radical, uh, longevity takes. But, uh, <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, I, I guess one question I'm interested in to hear from your perspective uh, people maybe tuning in who haven't listened to previous episodes or haven't followed you or whatever it might be, might not even know really what we're talking about here. They have a sense for sort of like, oh, we're talking about, you know, aging and, and longevity, but um, what are they actually talking about? H how do you um, introduce sort of fundamentally, and, and I think even for people who, who are familiar, it's always interesting to hear sort of a new frame of an introduction. Um, so I'd love to hear sort of how you introduce the subject of longevity and why sort of slowing or reversing aging is a hugely underappreciated, underfunded sort of mission. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's so many different ways you can frame uh, longevity and so many different ways you can, you know, bring it up with other people. And, you know, it depends who you're talking to, uh, different uh, framings re resonate with different people, but, um, I guess one of the most uh, interesting ways to get people on board or just introduce them to it is this, this question. I think Kristen Fortney or, or Laura Deming um, posed this question in, uh, I think it was in a podcast, an A16Z podcast maybe. But uh, yeah, basically the question is, why don't young people, like why don't 20 year olds get Alzheimer's, right? And there's this idea that uh, you know, we have all these age-related diseases and we don't have any cures for them, right? And they cause a lot of suffering and they reduce our, our lifespan and health span. Um, so maybe one way to uh, address this problem is to actually get to the root cause, which is aging, right? Because if we can just reverse the biological state of, you know, ourselves and our bodies, back to a youthful state, then we wouldn't even have to contend with these, you know, these issues of uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, even like, um, you know, heart disease, all the major killers, right? So just from a perspective of uh, medicine, I think we're clearly going to be on this sort of trajectory towards uh, longevity and rejuvenation therapies, right? So as long as medical technology continues to progress, we're basically going to go down this path of longevity. It's, it's the future of medicine, right? So that's one way you can frame it. 
Um, I think that's uh, one of the best ways because the problem is a lot of people uh, think of aging as something other than disease, right? Because it's sort of this thing that happens to everybody. And, uh, you know, the FDA doesn't declare it uh, or define it as a disease. So, but if you ask someone, uh, just someone on the street, can you tell me what medicine is, right? Like the, the practice of medicine, can you define medicine without using the words uh, disease and um, illness? Like how would you define it, right? And um, they'll probably say something like, oh, well, then the practice of medicine is trying to uh, keep yourself in like a healthy functioning way for as long as possible, right? Which is basically the goal of longevity biotechnology. We're just trying to do that for as long as possible and further than what we are currently accustomed to, right? But uh, for people who believe in technology and the, you know, the power of human ingenuity, then, you know, it, it's very possible that we could, you know, extend a healthy human lifespan beyond the status quo, and we should, right? That's, that's something that is uh, very, very much a moral thing to do in terms of reducing the suffering of humanity uh, that's associated with biological aging. And uh, it's just a, a beneficial thing to do in terms of, I guess you could say, just the trajectory of uh, human civilization, right? Because, you know, Balaji also has this, this great essay, you know, the purpose of uh, the purpose of technology is, is basically life extension, right? Because it's the ultimate way to reduce scarcity because we only have so much time, right? But if we can just extend that uh, indefinitely or at least much longer than we're accustomed to now, then that's, that's a huge uh, gain in, in uh, what's possible, you know, personally and also uh, from a societal point of view. Yeah, I think that's a, a great introduction from a couple of different angles and definitely a lot of overlap with sort of the ways that I like to uh, introduce the subject to sort of someone who just has no idea, you know, that that eight, that the, the first hump to sort of get over is like slowing and reversing aging is possible. That doesn't mean it's inevitable by any means in, you know, 15 or 30 years, let alone a thousand years, but it just means it's possible, right? And uh, we don't have enough evidence to suggest that it's impossible and it seems overwhelmingly likely that it is possible and it's just a matter of you know time and work and funding and attention and all of these different things and i think that's sort of like the first hump to get over and to get over that hump sort of introducing the concept of like you know why don't people get alzheimer's in their 20s is just like a really effective way to show hey you know if we can put aging you know if we can slow down aging a bit and put some of these diseases that are associated with aging just sort of kick the can down the road to you know instead of when you're 70 uh you start sort of developing these things when you're 150 then that's like a much you know longer healthier life theoretically and uh i think that's a really powerful way to go about it one of the sort of stats that i like to point to is um the fact that if we were to to cure cancer it would you know add like I don't know what it is exactly three or four years, I think to sort of the average human lifespan and then same basically goes for heart disease. But if you can, you know, if, if the average lifespan is like 80 or something like that, and you can slow aging by 10%, then you're adding eight years and that's just 10%. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there's all these different really, you know, great sort of frameworks to sort of reset people's thinking and, and make them realize that, Hey, this is, something you don't you don't need to work on it directly but like start acknowledging it you know maybe talk about it if you want to with friends it's it's like pretty interesting right and uh and maybe you know change the way that you see your life in the context of the world if you think that there's a some probability that that this can happen in your lifetime then then maybe that changes your life plans a little bit right um so i think those are all sort of interesting angles to take i guess um what is your you know, I think one of the the reasons it's sort of so underestimated is that it actually didn't make sense to pay much attention to until fairly recently because it was just a uh, you know somewhat of a hopeless endeavor. We didn't really have t any signs to to point to the idea that it might be possible. We didn't have 
you know, this uh, multiples extended lifespan in worms proven out, uh, you know, tens of percentages of increase in lifespan in, in, my, in mice, excuse me. Um, now we have sort of these signs. And so it's like a very new phenomenon that this somewhat, you know, it, it sounds very reasonable sort of suddenly. Um, how do you think, you know, why are people having trouble sort of wrapping their heads around this? Why is it such an underestimated issue from your perspective? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I have theories. I, I don't know if I have definitive answers, because if we had definitive answers, maybe uh, we could solve the, the issue of the organizational problem for longevity, which is like not enough people working on it. Um, I think, yeah, in, in one sense, it's just that it's still pretty new. Like, uh, you know, when the science is first flushed out, right? So I guess you can trace uh, sort of the very beginning of longevity biotechnology to um, Cynthia Kenyon, right? Uh, with uh, the C. elegans lifespan extension, you know, doubling it from by just uh, um, playing with the, the uh, IGF uh, DAF2 genes, right? So they, they found a genetic pathway that was responsible for uh, life extension, you know, by a factor of two in these, these little worms, right? So, but that was in 1993, right? So it takes time for these things to just, you know, filter through the public consciousness, through even the scientific, you know, community as well. I think um, partially, uh, one thing that that really helped was um, a bunch of companies, like well uh, well known people, getting involved in in longevity companies. So Laura has spoken about this, but sometime in I think 2013 or 2015, somewhere in that range, uh, Craig Venter, right, obviously very well known in in biotech, um, and um, and uh, Art Art Levinson from uh, Genentech. They both got into longevity, right? With Craig Venter with Human Longevity Inc. and uh, Art Levinson with Calico, which is Google's, you know, initiative. So it, it's really just this, you know, snowball effect. You need to get uh, people to stand up and say, "Okay, I'm going to risk my, you know, <laughs> my reputation to to align myself with these sort of radical ideas," right? And um, yeah, once it sort of takes off, you know. When you just need more people to to get on, and it'll grow exponentially because this this idea is extremely powerful. But I think, yeah, it just takes time. And um, and the other thing that I guess is a perhaps an impediment is that we don't really have a good way of of measuring aging in well in humans, right? Because we're so long lived, right? So if we had a way to you know, measure the effects of all these different therapeutics on biological age, then it would be more easy to convince you know, the public that you know, this is very much possible. But for now, you know, the, you know, the, the results that we have in you know, mice, like rapamycin and metformin, they're, they're pretty small increases, but reproducible. And uh, not many people know about it. I, and I guess why, I don't know. Maybe it's just, we don't have enough people talking about it. And like, you know, uh, I have a newsletter, but, and, you know, Reason has a great newsletter and uh, other people like uh, Mehdi uh, Yokubi also has a newsletter which talks about longevity. We just need more people talking about it. And if you think about, okay, uh, what other media outlets are there? There's your podcast, of course, which is great. Uh, who's doing this stuff on YouTube. There's like Eleanor Ashiki, who does great, you know, science communication about um, biotech and also longevity biotech. Um, so I think it's just a matter of, you know, getting people organized and these movements just take time. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, on the one hand, I totally agree. Uh, the only sort of caveat I might add is that, you know, it does, you know, while it does take time, I think the amount of time it takes is not set in stone, right? And so uh, I, was, I was recently listening to uh, Elon on Joe Rogan podcast, most recent appearance. Um, those are always a lot of fun. 
um, he was talking about how sort of the primary purpose of Tesla was to accelerate humanity's transition to sustainable energy. And, you know, he's, he talks about how, you know, we are going to run out of oil at some point. So it is inevitable. I, either we sort of transition to sustainable energy or we sort of, you know, we, we basically go extinct. I think, it, it, you know, maybe that's a little extreme, but humanity is sort of done for if we, if we can't figure something out. And so he wants to, with Tesla, just accelerate the timetable by which that inevitable thing happens. And I think aging is somewhat similar. It's like eventually this idea, just given how powerful it is and how fundamental it is, it seems sort of inevitable that it will catch on and sort of be developed, but it could be 30 years from now that we sort of achieve 30% human health, health span extension, uh, or it could be 300 years. And, you know, maybe, maybe one of those is, is actually sort of impractical. Maybe it's, it's more likely between hundred and 200 or, or 50 and 150 or something like that. But the point being that I think, um, doing things like you are, you are doing help to potentially sort of accelerate the, the time that it takes, even though it does sort of just take time. Um, so that's why I personally really am just like a fan. I think that, uh, I think that your point sort of towards the, the very beginning of the podcast was, was well received by me in, in that, you know, you could have gone and been a founder and you still can, of course. And I'm actually curious if that's something that's sort of on your mind, but, um, but I think that you're thinking about leverage and like, if you can inspire a hundred founders, that's actually maybe the better thing to do. And, you know, we don't need everyone to be a newsletter writer or a podcaster or whatever it is, but we barely have any in this longevity space. And so for starters, maybe we need more. And then down the line, you know, I'm sure you're learning a ton sort of doing these newsletters and you obviously have this science background. So maybe uh, one day you, you will be a founder. Is that, is that something that's sort of crossed your mind again at all? Yeah, totally. I mean, I always have that idea of, you know, becoming a biotech founder in the back pocket, right? Uh, there are some ideas that I think are, are really cool and are definitely worth trying, but I, I don't think I would go down the path of like, you know, finding some very specific, uh, you know, molecular target or, you know, metabolic pathway and like trying to drug that with a small molecule drug. I guess that stuff doesn't really interest me. I, I have more of a, I have a more like a uh, favor or maybe I, I believe that uh, maybe cell therapies, gene therapies and replacement therapies are the most interesting. So uh, I highly encourage everybody to look at, uh, or sorry, to check out uh, Jean Hebert's book, uh, Replacing Aging, which he wrote uh, just last year. And uh, he goes over, you know, the argument that to fully uh, reverse aging or, or, you know, cure aging, we'll probably have to replace uh, the parts of our bodies, you know, at the cellular level, tissue level, and even at, uh, you know, at the level of the brain. But he has, you know, a way of getting around that issue and, <laughs> and the, you know, the tricky questions of, consciousness and you know your personality still being intact but uh, yeah that's that's something that's always in at the back of my mind but um just wanted to go back to your point about you know getting people involved in this space and you know things taking time but um but you know being able to accelerate things if you actually you know join the movement and i think that is that is super important like taking matters into your own hands right you can't wait for you know billionaires to wake up to this and then, you know, save the day. You know, there's, there's so many things that uh, ordinary people like, like you and me, right, can just do today, right, to get involved in longevity. And um, there was a great tweet by, by John Carmack where he was saying, okay, if you can't build it, then fund it. And if you can't fund it, then champion it. So that's sort of become a part of my motto where, you know, uh, I, I say my mission is to grow a wave of passionate people building, funding, and championing uh, technologies that extend healthy human lifespan, right? So anyways, uh, yeah. So I think just, just don't underestimate 
what you can do today, right? Because there's, there's the in longevity industry is just so new that you know, there's so many things that people can be doing to accelerate progress. Great. So with all of that said, um, I think an interesting place to go would be to hear about what sort of technologies um, or, you know, specific drugs, maybe even, are you most excited about most keeping an eye on uh, for the next, you know, for, for the short term as like the first few successes potentially in the next, I don't know, five, 10, something like that um, number of years? Yeah. So that's a good question because really at this point, we have, we know we have drugs that extend lifespan in, in mice, right? Uh, but we don't have anything yet in humans, but if we can just demonstrate like even a small increase, that's going to really accelerate progress because, you know, we'll have the first zero to one in humans. We can prove that we can, you know, modulate uh, biological aging in humans uh, fairly easily, you know, if it's a small molecule drug, hopefully. So um, yeah, so to your question, which ones are, or which therapies are most interesting to me? I guess, yeah, the ones that are most likely to be able to uh, come to market or be approved within the next five years or so. So obviously, uh, Kristen Fortney's BioAge has two clinical trials right now, and uh, they look super promising. Um, they're in phase two. Uh, one is for unexplained adult uh, anemia, and the other one is like um, targeting immunosenescence. So basically uh, uh, trying to improve immune system response in elderly people who have COVID, right? And you can see that uh, if they can get this, if, the, if they can get like a positive result in these trials, then that's going to be a huge, huge like landmark result. Like it, it will change everything because not only uh, do we have something that, you know, could potentially be taken uh, for, other, for other indications, eventually, you know, age-related indications other than anemia or, you know, uh, COVID, but um, you could, yeah, see this becoming something that targets other age-related diseases. But then on top of that, just the way that they discovered these drugs, right? So BioAge uses uh, ML and uh, AI techniques to mine, you know, these uh, biobank data um, that they have. Um, yeah, it, that's just like an interesting way because hopefully, you know, you, that that process of drug discovery, leveraging AI can be, you know, reproduced and they can find other drugs that would be, uh, that could modulate aging. So I, I'm super excited about that. Um, and just, you know, the collision course between uh, biology, biotech and, you know, AI, uh, or sorry, uh, and uh, um, uh, AI ML, right? Um, and then, the other things that are sort of interesting to me um, are mitochondrial transfer, right? So mitochondria are a very important system in our cells, right? They, they do uh, oxidative phosphorylation, so they help you know, take your glucose and convert it into ATP. Um, and there's a lot of uh, suggestive evidence that you know, mitochondrial dysfunction uh, is plays a role in, in aging, right? And uh, there's three companies right now that are trying various approaches to actually transfuse uh, undamaged or young um, mitochondria into cells, so into your own cells. And uh, they're targeting various uh, indications. None of them are aging, obviously, because that's not an FDA uh, approved indication. But um, you could easily see like if it's uh, successful in these very narrow indications that maybe they could be expanded to more general things um, to uh, improve, uh, I guess, uh, metabolic function or, or, or the like. So that's very interesting to me uh, in terms of a strategy that is like a replacement therapy that could, you know, potentially come to market in and you know the short sort of five to ten years. Uh, so the the three companies there are uh, Selvi, Minovia. Minovia actually has a clinical trial right now for Pearson syndrome, and uh, and the last one is Metrix, Metrix Bio. 
So those are really cool. And then I think uh, two other really interesting approaches. Uh, one of them is um, young blood transfusion, right? So the thing that everybody makes fun of in, in like uh, the, the HBO show Silicon Valley, right? Blood Boys. But it's, you know, based on pretty solid science. Um, so it's interesting because, you know, uh, this sort of plasma epheresis or plasma transfusion is already a, a therapeutic uh, that's approved for certain uh, immuno uh, immunoconditions. Like, um, yeah, so you could easily see that this could be translated pretty easily to uh, the broader public because it's already something that we do pretty routinely. And um, there's good uh, suggestive ed evidence that it you know, taking either the neutral blood or the young blood plasma from, you know, uh, young mice and then putting it into old mice actually rejuvenates um, their, their tissues and including like uh, brain tissue. So that's uh, cool. And then the last one would be like epigenetic reprogramming. So that stuff is really new. Obviously, uh, you know, David Sinclair has some work on that and uh, Alejandro Ocampo, as well, doing like a transient epigenetic reprogramming. I think those are very interesting approaches, but um, there's so many different companies, like uh, there's like a hundred or so, maybe hundred, 200 companies in this space. And there's all these different uh, approaches and uh, I'm excited to see which ones will work out. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited as well. And I think for people who sort of enjoyed that, that last bit and uh, want to stay up on uh, Nathan's thinking around these things definitely again go follow the newsletter he's sort of publishing weekly updates on on what's going on and progress being made and, and everything he's excited about um, so you can sort of you know if, if you're interested in some of the more finer points that, then you can certainly go dig in there um, I want to take it to the personal level a little bit and talk about you know I, I think it's funny like a lot of people in the space um, answering the question of sort of what they do personally to uh, give themselves sort of the best chance at, at living long and, and healthy lives in the meantime, while we don't have, um, you know, these, these uh, more significant technologies and, and drugs and things like that. Um, the answer is always like, well, you know, not a whole lot yet. It's, it's sort of like the traditional wisdom of, you know, eat well and exercise and get enough sleep and, and things like this, maybe like take a vitamin. But you mentioned earlier you have this sort of, uh, I think it's called the BioHealth Stack website, which which I looked through and it has like David Sinclair and um, Ben Greenfield, some some pretty interesting people and, and sort of what they do and what their answers to the questions are. And I saw you know you have yours up there as well, and it's very like sleep heavy. So I'm curious to hear you know your your thinking around sleep uh, as well as uh, you know your your general health stack, as you might say. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You found that. Um, yeah, so the the website is Biohack Stack, and it yeah, I basically collate all these different uh, regimens and routines that um, people use to extend uh, their health span or lifespan. Mostly focuses on like longevity researchers or people who are well known in the biohacking space. But uh, yeah, uh, personally for myself. As you've noted, yeah, sleep is sort of one of those things that I struggle with a lot. Uh, mainly it's because I'm always working. So then you, you, you tend to like push the hours late at night because you're just working on that one extra thing. And then when you try and go to sleep right after, like going from laptop to bed, it's, uh, it's obviously uh, not recommended. And, you know, people say you should, you should stop looking at screens like a couple hours before bed and, I just have a hard time doing that. Um, but even the sleep that I get is sort of not great. So I, I have a bunch of sleep trackers. I have uh, the Aura Ring. Um, I have a Fitbit. I also have something called uh, the Dream 2, which is a EEG uh, sort of uh, sleep tracker. So it actually can measure the, the brain waves while uh, you sleep. And um, the when I... When I got the Dream 2, I actually compared it against, you know, all my other sleep trackers. And I found that uh, 
yeah, the Aura Ring and the Fitbit, which just use kind of like motion tracking to, to determine the different sleep stages. So trying to determine uh, REM sleep and deep, deep sleep. Uh, those were actually pretty inaccurate compared to the, the dream, which, um, which is, I guess, to be expected because they aren't actually measuring your brain waves. But uh, the one thing I did notice from, you know, trying out this dream to uh, sleep headband is I get like a lot of REM sleep, but not a lot of deep sleep, which uh, could be an issue, right? So, um, so I do, you know, try and take uh, different supplements. I have uh, magnesium glyconate, which I tried for a while. Um, there's this really great website uh, or I guess web app called BioLoop Sleep, which allows you to do like end of one experiments uh, for your sleep that connects to one of your sleep trackers, like an Aura Ring or a Fitbit. And then you can do like these, you know, on off sort of uh, end of one experiments, uh, you know, trying different interventions like uh, a supplement or, or uh, meditation or something like that, right? So that's interesting. Uh, but in terms of like more of the hardcore stuff, like, uh, you know, taking rapamycin or metformin, no, I, I, don't, I don't actually take any of those because I, I feel like we don't have enough evidence. I mean, you, if you believe that, you know, uh, preclinical like mouse, mouse studies are, are good enough for you, then I guess that's your own decision. But that's not something I would recommend. And people like Mir Barzilai also don't recommend you, you take metformin for, for anti-aging. Um, but then just other things like vitamin D, that's kind of important being in uh, Canada when the winters are quite long. So you don't really get a lot of sunlight. I also spend a lot of time indoors working. So, uh, but other than that, it's just like the, the basic stuff. So, um, you know, intermittent fasting, uh, not eating too much sugar, uh, exercising. So I really like doing uh, high intensity interval training um, and, you know, just some basic weightlifting, although that's harder now because of COVID and uh, all the gyms here are closed. Um, yeah, so other than, you know, some basic stuff, uh, you know, couple heavy sleep trackers. I don't really consider myself as like a hardcore biohacker or anything like that. But okay, maybe I, I should say this. Um, the uh, out of all the people that I've sort of, you know, looked at their their stacks and stuff like that, I think the guy that has the most sort of like uh, the most robust sort of approach and analytical approach to doing this kind of longevity hacking is probably uh, Michael Lustgarden. He's a uh, a researcher at Tufts University, and he has like, like a very you know interesting and detailed um, approach to uh, you know measuring his uh, his biological age uh, and all the different interventions that he's using to try and uh, modulate that. So I think out of all the people, if you're interested in this like longevity hacking interventions, you should go follow him. That's great. Yeah. I, uh... I was sort of, I, I read your health stack on, on the website, but I was sort of hoping there might be some new uh, magic addition in there because you're, you're, uh, you, you look quite young. So I, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe he's got something that's, that's working for him, but, but whatever it is, uh, I, I'd say keep it up. Um, and, and on the sleep thing, I, I certainly can sympathize there. I think I've come to believe that it's probably, you know, good to sleep a good amount, but, um, but I, I sort of, I don't know if it's because I want to or because I'm, I'm not like totally there yet. I, I sometimes question like, well, if it, you know, if sleeping eight hours a night, if it doesn't really change how I feel day to day, and there's certainly argument that it does, uh, I think I generally feel better when I sleep more, but, but throw that out the day to day argument and say, you know, it extends my, my health span by 10 years. Well, I'm actually sleeping, you know, eight hours versus six hours is, is two hours a day. I'm spending sleeping instead of awake and sort of it, it almost like cancels out in a way. Um, so I don't know. I, I sort of go back and forth on the sleep thing. I track it with aura. Uh, and I think that that's really important because, you know, what gets measured gets managed is sort of the, the quote I always think of. And, you know, regardless of what your goal is, if you want to sleep eight and a half hours or you want to sleep six and a half hours, um, you're not going to sort of meet it if you don't have something to measure it. And so I think 
you know, maybe for people who want to go to the next level, it sounds like the headband that you have is, is very helpful as well. Um, but just a, an important thing I think to note is like anywhere you want to improve, find a way to measure it. And that goes for, you know, you mentioned intermittent fasting. I think when I was getting started, I used the zero app. Um, I just sort of do it habitually now and I, I don't use the app anymore, but, um, that's sort of a, an important thing to note, I think. And I think, you know, we're, we're young guys, so we don't actually have to do that much yet. Like if I was older, I might be experimenting with metformin myself. But, um, you know, despite the lack of like a, a ton of proof thus far, but um, I think we're so young, we can fortunately afford to sort of be patient and, and hope that some more concrete discoveries are made and just be healthy in the more traditional ways for now and, um, you know, do our best to, to increase the timeline like we spoke about earlier. Uh, I think the appropriate way to end this conversation is to talk about a question that I was actually asked recently on a podcast when I, when I went on as a guest that they, they opened up the podcast with this. It was uh, the Lewis and Kyle show. If anyone wants to go listen, but the first question they asked me out of the gate was basically um, how long do I expect to live? So I would like to turn that on you. And of course, you know, you don't have to just give a, a one number answer. You can sort of talk it through a little bit, how you think about it, but curious to know sort of how you think about that question. <laughs> That's a good question. And I feel like um, a lot of people get caught flat-footed trying to, go to make a, a reasonable estimation here. Um, I'm going to say there's maybe a 50% chance of me possibly living past 120. And then that's all I'm going to say, because really everything is speculation at this point. Right? And you can't really project what is going to happen uh, in the future in whatever timeline. But um, I do believe that if we can get uh, most of society on board working on, you know, this problem of biological aging, that it could be very possible to have some sort of longevity escape velocity, right? And then there's also the, the idea that, you know, AGI might be able to come in as like a sort of like a saves the day, days ex machina sort of thing. Um, and there's different, but people don't really know when that's going to happen either, right? So to me, I think the best way to just frame it is to just say there's, there's a possibility of humans, right? People, um, uh, people mostly our age, you know, in the early um, 30s or 20s or whatever, I think there's a good case to be made that we will live significantly past the, you know, the maximum lifespan records that we have now. And um, if you look at uh, Max Roser, he, he has a bunch of, you know, data or, or world in data. That's his website. He, uh, he made a tweet today that was really cool, where it was just showing like the survival curves. Um, so basically, uh, on one side, you have um, the percent of a population that has survived past a certain uh, age. And then on, on the, you know, on the x-axis, you have the age, right? So this is like a pretty common sort of curve that you see in a lot of these mouse lifespan studies. But if you do it in humans, right, you can actually see that like the top 10% of, you know, uh, long lifers, whatever, the... The, the people who survive, um, you can see that, yeah, the top 10% or even the top 20%, like that that uh, maximum lifespan has actually been increasing as well. And uh, that's that's very interesting to me that, uh, you know, that even without any sort of major technological or, or bio longevity biotechnological advance, we still get these sort of increases that are happening. And uh, I think there could be like a, a big increase in the future, as long as if we get everybody on board, right? So I can't predict what that's going to be like, because that's more like predicting how society is going to organize itself. And, and that's, that's a harder, harder question. But uh, I'm curious, what did you say? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I actually responded very similarly to you. I didn't give any, you know, specific numbers or uh, like super specific probabilities, but I basically said, 
uh, I think my, my year mark was basically the same as yours too. I don't remember exactly, but I think I said something along the lines of, I think there's like a reasonable chance, uh, you know, I don't know if I put out exact numbers, but 30 to 70, you know, in or around 50% chance that I could live longer than 125. I think I used instead of 120 either way for the same reason that you did basically to say longer than any human has ever lived on record. And that's sort of enough. If you can say, you know, 50% chance that I outlive anyone who's ever lived, that's like a pretty bold claim. And if you get someone to subscribe to that, then it's saying like, okay, well, now you're on board. Like, let's, you know, you're, you're pro longevity. And the more people that are pro longevity, the more funding will go to it. The more attention the industry will have, the more people will want to work on it, the more kids will grow up saying, I want to make a difference in longevity, and then doing so and podcasts and newsletters like we're doing. So I think attention is sort of, you mentioned earlier, like, you know, if you can't build it, fund it. If you can't fund it, champion it. I think championing in terms of attention is sort of the first thing. And then with the attention comes funding and with the funding comes progress. And uh, so that was sort of my, my intention as well, just to sort of break the idea that we can't live longer than anyone's ever lived. And it's actually not that useful from my perspective to talk beyond that. Like, what are the chances I live beyond 250? Well, you know, I could speculate, but it's, you know, what's the point, right? Um, The idea that we can live longer than anyone else has ever lived is sort of enough. And this is, some people are sort of scared about about longevity and and we could dig into that another time maybe. But um, the thing people sort of fail to appreciate, I think, is that this is, uh, I actually heard this from Vitalik recently on a podcast um, with, uh, Julia Gallif. I, I hope I'm pr- pronouncing that somewhat reasonably right. But, uh, he talks about how aging is not like the internet where it sort of comes and over 20 years, like radically changes the world, uh, or even crypto for that matter. It's something where, you know, we only age one year at a time. So even if we have all these, these great technologies that really increase the human health span, we're not going to have 150 year olds in 10 years because no one's 140, right? And so this progress will actually happen over a slow time. And if we can just for now get sort of, you know, come to accept the idea that we can go beyond 120 or 125, I think that's enough. And so I think we thought about the question um, somewhat similarly, but, uh, but yeah, I appreciate you, uh, you coming on. I, I know we've gone over time already. It's funny. These, these longevity podcasts I do, or the, uh, the longevity focused ones, at least, always end up going longer than, than most of my other podcasts. And maybe it's uh, something to be said for the way that, that people like you and I and all these other folks in longevity think we're not in a particular rush because uh, we might have 125 years at least. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I enjoyed our talk as well. Thank you. Great. So uh, where can people go and follow your progress? Uh, you know, we mentioned the newsletter. If you could just sort of point people to the first place you want to send them. Uh, and then, uh, you know, hopefully they can go do so and, and follow along in the future. Yeah. So um, my newsletter, uh, which is a longevity market cap newsletter, is at uh, sub, S-U-B, dot uh, longevitymarketcap.com. So you can go there to subscribe. It's uh, usually once a week, just uh, sort of a roundup of interesting things. That's that are going on in the longevity uh, biotech industry. Um, it also has like more in-depth research reports that I, I release maybe once every two or three weeks. Um, and then if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is real Nathan Cheng, uh, that's C-H-E-N-G. And uh, yeah, I just you know post my thoughts there as well. 